I don't even know what that word is. If you don't know what that word is, look it up. Okay. Don't do it. Just before you started, I'm going to say that this video is brought to you by our friend. <laughs> brought to you by who? <laughs> Ah, uh, it's brought to you by our friends over at HelloFresh. I'll tell you more about them in just a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blazer. As always, I'm your host, Simon Wammers here. Uh, this one's written by Kevin. Thank you, Kevin, guest author. I'm going to read it. Sam's going to edit it. That's what we do here. This is... I'm just finding out right now the worst business decisions of the century so far. I uh, feel really old because I'm like... <laughs> How far through the century are we, Kevin? And it's like, oh no, good quarter. We're basically almost a quarter of a way through the century. Which is mental. Let's go. Okay, let's go. When you think of horrible business decisions, there are a lot that probably come to mind. Blockbuster not buying Netflix for $50 million, Coca-Cola changing their formula to remove the cocaine, those bastards, and Serano selling a bread box full of lives. These are some obvious examples, all of which I believe have already been covered here already. Yes, Netflix and the $50 million, though, like Blockbuster not buying it. It's like, yeah, but if they did buy it, it would probably not be what it is today. That's the thing. It's like, oh, you know, whenever you hear like some company missed the opportunity to, to buy something or whatever, it's always like, yeah, but uh, it, they would have just made it worse and it probably would have failed. Like Yahoo buying Google or whatever. It would just be shit like Yahoo, allegedly, instead of being the ultimate god king and business daddy Google. But I know how much Simon and the viewers love shit on companies for making stupid decisions. Boy, do we ever! So, it's high time we look at some more. Here are the worst business decisions of the 21st century. What was that, Simon? Get your shit together. Worst business decisions of the 21st century made by companies that were definitely large enough to know better. Customers don't want the truth. Stores use a lot of silly gimmicks and promotions to try and win over customers. First, stores started making every price end in 99 instead of an even dollar amount to make products seem cheaper. Someone may scoff at the idea of paying $6 for a jar of Nutella, but $5.99. That price starts with a five, so it must be like a whole dollar cheaper. And this is the sort of thing where you're like, nah. No, nah, I know. I know it's $6. I'm not stupid. I know that it's really $6, but apparently, look, obviously this works. Because everyone knows it's stupid, but all the companies keep doing it anyway, so it's obviously working. Your intellect is as weak as your dollar. This scheme does still work, but people have gotten used to seeing the 99 at the end of prices. It would be weird if shit didn't have it now. You'd go into a store and be like, why is everything even round numbers? <laughs> It was ridiculous. When Walmart started becoming the massive global empire that it is today, they had a plan to lure in everyone else's customers. Why end their prices in 99 when they could end them all in 98? Despite blatant manipulation, it remains a powerful psychological weapon against stupid customers. Wait, really? Walmart actually do this? Prices end in 98? Who does that? psychos, that's who. Then there are the furniture stores. Have you ever seen a local furniture store that wasn't having a going out of business sale? Oh my god, DFS is the, uh, the one in the UK. It'd be like, ever, any reason, I don't know if the DFS even still exists, but my childhood was filled with adverts where it was like, DFS sofas, the Easter sale, the September sale, the January the 19th sale. It would just always be on sale, like 70% off sofas this weekend only. And would be like, are the sofas ever the full price? I don't know. They probably just have one little store somewhere that no one ever goes to where all the sofas are full price so they can say that they're selling them at a discount. I mean, allegedly. I I don't know what was going on there, but it was always on sale. I've come to bargain. You've come to die. One of my favorite furniture store promotions was from 2004 when the legends at Jordan's Furniture and Institution here in New England. New England. That's where Kevin's from. Massachusetts, I think promise that any furniture bought during the regular baseball season would be free if the Red Sox won the World Series. Wait, any furniture for f would be free? That seems insane. What if they win? They're gonna win, aren't they? 
That year, for the first time in 86 years, the Red Sox won. You might think that this would be one of the worst business decisions ever, but they were able to run the promotion by buying an insurance policy, so it worked out fantastically for them. That's actually amazing, you legitimate legends. That is so smart. But of all the pricing games and fake sales, probably the worst offenders are clothing stores, particularly cheap clothing stores. The shirts may be marked at $50, but everything in the store is half off. Then there's another promotion for 20% off if you spend $50 or more, and then there's a coupon that you got in the Sunday paper for an additional 50% off. Suddenly that $50 shirt is only $10 and you feel like you're getting a great deal. Yeah, this shouldn't be allowed. There was a there's a store. God, what was it called? There was a big menswear store when I was a kid that was all that, that was basically based on this model and it was always like 70% off. So you felt like you were getting such a good deal, but it's it was really never full price. How is maybe that's not allowed anymore because I haven't seen stores doing this for a long time. Except you're not, and you know you're not. Deep down in your heart, I was a kid. I thought I was, but I was a kid. As an adult, I'm like that's a scam. <laughs> Deep down in your heart, you understand that it's just a shitty $10 shirt. Hell, $10 is probably too much for this piece of crap. It's all just a game to make you feel better about yourself. You know it, I know it, and when Ron Johnson was hired in 2012 as the new CEO of JCPenney, he knew it too. He was a former Apple executive who was brought on to help the company that was struggling against competitive giants like Walmart, and he had a plan. Quit with all the desperate bullshit and just put the correct price on everything from the start. This isn't going to go well, is it? Is it? Everyone's going to be like, Jay-Z Betty, we liked being lied to, you bastards. Now we know it's sh we were kidding ourselves. We were telling our friends the t-shirt was $50 when everyone knows it's a lie. I'm into that shit. It wasn't. If that wasn't enough, they also cut the 99 cents nonsense and just put the price in dollar amounts. A CEO suggesting an honest approach to business was pretty much unprecedented throughout human history. <laughs> so I suppose he can't be blamed for not realizing how horribly it was going to go. As soon as they cut all the fake discount sales plummeted. The company's executives were hopeful that this was going to turn the business around after a bit of a few growing pains, but investors were not convinced. By November, just two months into Johnson's plan, JC Penny stock had fallen 50% over the year, with at least half of that being directly related to Johnson's new pricing initiative. Yes, very sad. Anyway, things weren't going to get better either. Three months later, in February 2013, Penny posted the worst quarterly earnings ever. Well, look, JC Penny, that's what f***ing honesty gets you, isn't it? You should have known just f***ing lie. Lie to your customers. Lie. You should have lied to your investors too. You just should have committed fraud. You'd be like, no, guys, profits are bigger than ever. Just embrace lying. And then, come on. Well, I mean, okay, that doesn't make sense because they were being honest and then they would lie to their investors. Also, I'm not encouraging fraud. It's what we call a joke. Lies. Oh, lies! This wasn't just their worst quarterly earnings. This was the worst quarterly earnings report in all of retail history up to that point and possibly since. Holy I mean, I expected this to go badly wrong because we're doing a video about bad business decisions, but I did not expect it to go this badly wrong. Their earnings had fallen 31% from the previous quarter. That's quite terrible, but this was Q4, which included the entire holiday shopping season, and we all know how important that is. To say, even, even me, I don't do any, like, I'm as far from retail as possible, but I do know that retail companies advertise on my videos, and I do know that in December I make a lot more money than I do in other months. I was going to say for the rest of the year, but obviously that's not true. It's not like I make more in December than any other time. And it's also less true now than it was in the past because everyone makes so many more videos in December because they all know this. I used to make more videos in December because the ad revenue was so much higher. And now because everyone does that, it's more evened off. And January used to be like a fuck. January and February suck because January, all of the companies have spent all of their ad money on Christmas and there's no money left. And uh, February sucks because it's like 28 or 29 days. Um, so yeah, the beginning of the year is rough. In fact, land. <laughs> yes, very sad. Anyway, it's not. Uh, it still does great, but it's like just it's just less than after December where you've made like a lot of money and you're like sweet <sighs> money. Not even Jesus Santa and the Hanukkah zombie could save. Is that how you spell Hanukkah? <laughs> 
Ah! Could save this company from the massive drop in sales, even though the prices were effectively the same, just more honest, customers hated it. They missed doing all the extra work of jumping through hoops to get the same prices that were not offered up front. There's also the psychological effect that when a person sees a $50 shirt marked down to dead dollars, they think they're getting a good deal on high quality clothing. But when they see the same item regularly priced at $10, they assume it's cheap garbage. I felt pretty baller the other day. Uh, a friend of mine was wearing a really nice t-shirt and I was like, mate, that's a really nice t-shirt. And he was like, yeah, it's uh, it's tailored. And I'm like, you bought a tailored t-shirt. And it's like, I've got some tailored clothes, but no tailored t-shirts. I'm like, where'd you get this? And he's like, there's an online store based out of Denmark that does all your measurements and they'll make you up a t-shirt. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you their name yet because I, I haven't got the shirt. I don't know if it's good yet. But he was like, it's sick. It was like $100 or like $90 for a t-shirt in euros. It was like 80 euros. And I'm like... Nice. Jesus. I never thought there would be a world where I spend $90 on a t-shirt. But I'm like, let's give it a go. <laughs> yeah. I know there are designer t-shirts that are that much, but that's just stupid. You're paying for a label, a no label, or whatever, or something very ugly. I don't buy designer clothes. I think they're just uh, there's, I buy high quality clothes, but you won't see any labels on them because I think that's just kind of. I don't know, I find it both too expensive and trashy. After what must have been an excruciating 17 months, Ron Johnson was fired as CEO. You might be saying, so what? This is corporate America. He probably got paid hundreds of millions of dollars to run that company into the grounds. <gasps> Au contraire, mon ami! He was the CEO of a company with over 1,100 retail locations in the United States, and he received an annual salary of only $1.5 million. Really? Come on! I mean, obviously it's a lot of money, but you're the CEO of a company that I've heard of, and we don't have JCPenney. If I've heard of it, it's a big deal. For a top-level executive in the United States to get fired without severance, you know he had to have bent that entire company over the table and gone... <laughs> Holy s***, <shit>, Kevin. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Let me interrupt today's video to tell you about our good friends over at HelloFresh. Yes, yes, HelloFresh have recipes that are so delicious. That's how they describe it, but they are. I mean, you should, uh, there'll be pictures of the food they have on the screen right now, and it's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even if you're not good at cooking, you can handle this. Because all the ingredients, this is not in the order they want at all, but look, all of the ingredients are pre-picked out. They're all in these little sachets and boxes and ready to go. Like, I've said this before. I say this again. Um, I hate going to the store. Like, I don't mind cooking. I don't mind cooking. I like cooking. I like putting it all together. It's kind of relaxing. I usually pour myself a nice fat glass of wine and make some meal. It's nice. Uh, what I don't like doing is picking out all the ingredients and the store not having the ingredients that I want. You don't have to worry about that with all, at all with HelloFresh. It just arrives in a nice little box and it's ready to go. Also, sustainability. The boxes. See, I don't even need these talking points. I can do it without them. Unless you're not seeing this ad, in which case I had to remake the ad because... I clearly did need them. Uh, the boxes are sustainable. They're like made from recycled material or they're like super recyclable, something like that. Look, it's, what is that? I should probably get that right because otherwise they'll be like, you got it wrong. <laughs> packaging is recyclable. Nearly all packaging is recyclable. And they're at first carbon neutral milk it company. That's nice. Uh, also, HelloFresh is easier. I said that. I uh, also help you reach your goals. Look, if you want to be vegetarian or vegan or something crazy like that, you could do that with HelloFresh. Do they support carnivores? I would like that. Just the meat package. <laughs> um, yeah, or like, just if you want to be healthier, if you want to eat more healthy, they can also handle all of that stuff. So look, HelloFresh, not only is it amazing, there's also an amazing deal. All you need to do is go to HelloFresh.com and use the code BRAIN16 and you'll get 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts, which uh, honestly is brilliant. Repeat offer URL and promo code. Yes, sir. HelloFresh.com. Use the promo code BRAIN16. 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. Thank you very much. Back to the show. Porn has no place on the internet. Can you imagine logging onto the internet only to discover that there are images of an adult naked available to those who would seek them out? Wait, there are? I know it's hard to believe, but this dystopian nightmare is the sad reality in which we live. It was even more of a nightmare for Yahoo after they purchased Tumblr for the price of $1.1 billion back in 2013. Tumblr's still around though, isn't it? I mean, that's... Isn't it? People tumble. Oh, wait, I'm thinking of Pinterest. I'm definitely thinking of Pinterest, and I still use Pinterest. Do people tumble? Is that what people did on Tumblr? Did they tumble? You'd think that at least one person at Yahoo would have thought to make an account on Tumblr before the purchase so they could have looked at the actual content and discovered that it was like 90% yiffing. 
I don't even know what that word is. If you don't know what that word is, look it up. Okay. Don't do it. For my sins. Let's be careful we're not in the Google image tab. No. Jesus. Uh... Well, sexual activity with other furries. Wait, that's not a definition. Google, sometimes you just get it wrong. Yif is a slang term used in the furry fandom to refer to pornographic content. Okay, so it's furry porn. Kevin, you could have said that. Why'd you have to waste my time with this? My time is valuable, Kevin! Fuck. I'm just, that's, that's fake outrage. I don't really mind. I'm so glad that I got to learn about that and put it in my internet history, to be honest. Thank God this video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. It's not, but that's a free plug. I mean, it might be. The ends get spliced in later, so uh, who knows? If you don't know what they were read already, Yahoo CEO Marissa Mayer said that Tumblr was redefining creative expression online and a press release from Yahoo. Wait, was 90% of Tumblr really furry porn? I don't believe that. I've heard of Tumblr. I, I, I've <laughs> got no interest in furry porn. Right. I mostly just... Read Zootopia porn, so. The fuck? And a press release from Yahoo immediately following the purchase promised not to screw it up. It was a promise that they were not prepared to keep. Tumblr had always had trouble monetizing, so I have no doubt that they were more than happy to accept the $1.1 billion. Now it was Yahoo's problem, and it was a major problem. The company struggled to make money, because it turns out that large advertisers, the types who could keep a company like that afloat, don't want their banner ads displayed next to a gif of grandma's home. Holy shit, Kevin. <laughs> That's not where we go with this. We're not saying that. We're not saying that. After five years of failing to figure out how to make this site profitable, they could have just given up and got their losses. The entire user base on Tumblr certainly wishes they did. Instead, on December the 17th, 2018, Tumblr banned all adult content. I understand that they wanted to get ad dollars, but it is seriously so clear that no one at the company with decision-making power had ever so much as looked at the site. There was just so, so much porn. You sick bitch! Look at this! Chicks with dicks! At the time, the ban went into effect, reportedly 16.45% of accounts posted exclusively pornographic material. That's a fairly sizable number, but that also means those accounts didn't post written blogs, pictures of a pretty cloud, or some a random meme for the lulz. They were exclusively posting porn. That meant that the actual amount of porn on the site was way, way higher, as most accounts would post something that wasn't adult content at some point. Even before this, Yahoo had grossly mismanaged their acquisition. The entire company had become a revolving door of employees, especially at the executive level. A new person would be in charge every few months, always wanting to implement their own top-down business goals. Yeah, like, fast turnover of executive staff doesn't really sing a lot of confidence for a business, does it? These goals never included even a basic understanding of the site and its users, and so they always failed. The final nail in the coffin for adult content on Tumblr was in November of 2018 when Apple removed it from the App Store because the website hosted child pornography. Uh-oh! <laughs> Yahoo, what have you bought? It is shit, Austin. That's probably true of any widely used blog site, but it's not like Tumblr had been ignoring the problem. The company had a dedicated team of 20 people whose sole job was to try and police the site for illegal content. The people who do this are f***ing heroes. Because I, you hear about this every now and again, about these like giant buildings filled with people who just have to look at horrible sh** every day that arseholes post to the internet that has to be removed by someone. Fuck me. I remember sometimes, you know, where you've stumbled across. I remember once I accidentally saw a picture of uh, bodies in a, after a plane crash. Just, I, I can't even remember how I stumbled across this. I still remember that moment and it still scars me. And there are people out there whose job it is to remove that sh just to look at it and be like, let's remove that. And videos and all sorts of the nastiest sh you could possibly imagine that people have to remove from these websites. I even feel slightly sick thinking about that one image that I saw, and this is what people do. Every day, all day. I would just, I mean, get some suicide nets in those buildings, Jesus. You guys, you are the real heroes. 
Well, on that cheery note, let's move on. <laughs> they had a close working relationship with the FBI, to whom they would report anyone they found posting the sort of material on the site. After six years of destroying Tumblr, Yahoo, now owned by Verizon, packed it in and sold the blog site to the company that owns WordPress. Ah, your problem now, but it's gonna be, they probably sold it for like 50p. I hope this episode is sponsored by Squarespace because WordPress is such shit. When Tumblr sold in 2019, it went for 3 million. It was 1.1 billion in 2013. Six years, guys. Six years. That's a total loss for Yahoo of 1.097 billion. My savage, mate. Or a 99.7% loss on ROI. Negative ROI. That may seem bad. But it's just based on the purchase and sale numbers. Once you factor in all of the money wasted operating a 200 person company for six years, it's actually much, much worse. Tumblr isn't the only company to hate adult content either. OnlyFans is a site that was almost exclusively dedicated to pornography, and they proposed a ban on adult content due to issue paying some of their creators because certain banks wouldn't handle transactions revolving around adult content. In this case, I remember this, and it was a stupid decision by OnlyFans, but also just let's get new banks adult content is totally fine like what sort of world do we live in where a bank is like or like visa and wasn't it visa and mastercard or something like that they didn't want to or someone didn't want to process the payments and i'm like that is that is the stupidest shit i've ever heard surely there are payment processors who like money and are totally fine with adult content I don't understand what the problem with adult content is. No one's get. I mean, of course, in the adult entertainment world and everything that surrounds it, of course there are people who are being exploited. But there are also a ton of people who are just genuinely making money doing what they do and... Who gives a f***? Like, and combating the illegal and exploitative stuff that goes on isn't done by just blanket banning pornography that's insane and it's not gonna work it's like prohibition it's like oh there's so many ills with alcohol so we'll just ban alcohol doesn't work it's a good idea but the implementation just doesn't work jesus oh my god oh my god i have a disease all right i need help they did walk this decision back upon realizing that their entire website would collapse without porn but there's some scuttlebutt that they might bring back a ban on adult content in preparation for an ipo and i'll tell you what only fans how do you think that ipo is going to work when you ban the main thing that your product supplies that your company supplies how do you think that's going to work it's not going to work well you're going to have like that we work version of an ipo when they're like we're going for it oh god no <laughs> we work what a show allegedly giving bezos a helping hand they say a rising tide lifts all boats and to an extent that's true when i was a collectibles dealer it wasn't uncommon for us and other local comic and card stores to help each other out we might get customers sent to us from a nearby store because they were out of stock of something but the owners knew that we had some on hand likewise i may direct someone looking to sell an item we had no market for to another dealer i knew who specialized in that kind of thing i love this bit of business i love it when businesses are friendly to each other i feel like youtube is like really nice everyone's doing their thing like i know other creators who make like educational entertainment content like i do and it's not like we're all like hang out or whatever and talk to each other and it's like no one's like oh f you man you're, you're like getting in on my turf i had this market locked up man fuck you i'll see you at work oh, you don't hate me because i'm beautiful everyone's like now nah, there's loads of people who want to watch and everyone watches everything and everyone makes lots of money and it's just like this is great <laughs> I love it. I'm so happy. I'd hate to be in something where it's like people are like, it's really competitive and hard. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> I guess it's like the difference between entertainment and like proper business. But we were small stores with one to four employees each and finite buying power and inventory space. So this sort of relationship was mutually beneficial for us and good for the customers as well. The same is not true for billion dollar companies with miles and miles of warehouse space. As of 2001, Amazon still hadn't turned to profit. It began as an online bookstore and by that point, the bookselling portion of the site was in the black or in the red if you're from China. Do they really use that in China? <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that just a weird joke? 
But the company as a whole wasn't profitable yet. Still, they were the largest online bookseller at the time, and they did it better than anyone. Established bookstores like Barnes & Noble and Borders dominated physical retail space. Barnes & Noble had been selling books online since 1997, albeit less successfully than Amazon, but Borders just couldn't be asked to even bother. Instead, in 2001, Borders teamed up with Amazon. The financial terms of the deal were not made public, but no matter what the terms were, Borders f***ed themselves pretty hard. I know this story. I've covered this before. Might not be on this channel, but I know this. I remember it was either a Borders or a Barnes & Noble. Opens a giant store in some out-of-town shopping center relatively close to where I grew up. And it was awesome. It was this giant bookstore like I'd never seen. I was like, oh, and then a Best Buy opens. And I was like, this is where they take all those cool American stores that we see in movies and they bring them to the UK. And this was, it was a place called Lakeside. If anyone, there's quite a few people who watch this. Maybe you remember this store as well. It closed. And you could just go in. There was like a cafe you could grab. It was like a library, except you could buy the books. And it was really awesome. Bookstores are cool. I still go to bookstores. I was just going to say like, yeah, but no one uses bookstores anymore. And it's like, I totally use bookstores. I love going to the bookstore. And I think I buy most of my books in the bookstore, which is kind of crazy. Nah, I, I don't know if that's true. I probably still buy more or read more ebooks than I do regular books. But I still love buying books. Customers of Borders looking to buy books online would be directed to Amazon, who would handle the inventory, shipping, and customer service. Ah, <laughs> Borders, what are you doing? Even today, People are hesitant, and I don't know if this is a conspiracy theory, so let's just preface this with allegedly. But there's that whole, um, I've watched YouTube videos about this because I find it fascinating. There's the whole, um, oh god, what's it called? The fulfillment thing, where you'll buy a drop shipping, where people will buy like this. Let's use this example. This is my definitely not my crimes notebook that I made for another channel that I do, Casual Criminalist. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong camera. This is what I use when I'm not reading the script. Get it right, backed boy. I got like 500 of these made up in China and like a sample shipped out and then they go they print them all and then they send five uh, they send 250 to america they send 250 to poland in the european union and then the it's the same company that oh, i'm not wearing a merch shirt it's the same company that do my merch shirts they take them they put them on an online store i talk about them share a link and people go buy them and they ship them all out amazon also do this but allegedly amazon look at these products and they'll be like that's a nice notebook that simon's selling for like 15 bucks um, obviously it wouldn't work with this because it's branded with my brand and that's the reason people buy it. But let's just say they really like this like leather notebook. They would be like, okay, well, we're just going to source our own leather notebook and sell it the cheaper than the guy who's selling it through us already. So we don't have to give him a share of the profits and we just take all the money. So you, these people who are doing the businesses like this, you're allegedly doing all of this market research for Amazon and paying them for the privilege. And then they're just going to muscle in on your turf and take your business. It is f***ing sketchy as f***, allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, Amazon would do nothing different except post store locations for Borders on their website. Borders locations were also supposed to promote shopping online at Amazon. Borders had technically attempted to sell books online themselves before this, but it went horribly. Once the deal was in place, they pretty much fired their entire online staff and gave up on the entire project. For six years, Borders bookstores would promote Amazon in their physical locations before breaking out of the deal. At first, it probably seemed like a great idea. I mean, it wasn't, and they absolutely should have known better, but clearly someone thought it was a great idea. Amazon would benefit from Borders' name recognition, and Borders would get to avoid having to deal with all of that internet malarkey that was scary and confusing. There were three main problems with this deal that was going to be absolutely devastating for Borders. The first was that this wasn't a merger, it was a partnership. Borders would tell people looking to shop online to go to Amazon, and Amazon listed physical locations for Borders. But who cares? Because problem number two is that shopping online was cheaper, easier, and faster than going to the store. Sure, you still had to wait for it to be delivered, but that was a small price to pay to never have to leave the house. Ah, yes, the joy of never leaving the house. But going to the books, like going to the soup buying stuff, pff, going to the bookstore, it's a nice experience. You browse the books, you have a good time. I'm not leaving. I'm not fucking leaving! <laughs> 
The third problem is one that I feel is extremely underrated in terms of how badly waters f*** themselves. The Amazon website is described as being co-branded, but that doesn't really seem accurate. I hopped to the Wayback Machine and scoured the Amazon site from 2001-2007 when this deal was active and I saw no mention of borders. At one point, the site listed Target and Toys R Us as featured partners, but no mention of borders anywhere that I could find. Probably the people at borders didn't have internet, so they couldn't check. What I can tell you did happen, and what they probably meant by co-branded, is that from 2001 to 2007, going to borders.com redirected your browser to amazon.com. By the time borders realized what they'd done, it was too late. They pulled out of the deal in 2007 with no online presence and no e-commerce system in place. Hell, the company hadn't even had a website for the past six years. This was in 2007. I know it's a long time ago, but it's not ancient history. And it's pretty wild that Borders didn't have a website in 2007. They had a redirection <laughs> to Amazon. <laughs> On September 28, 2011, 10 years after making a deal to help out a struggling online book retailer and save themselves the hassle of learning how technology worked, Borders closed the doors to its final store. I'm pretty sure I've said this in a script on another channel, but the moral of this story remains clear. Never help anybody. And on that lesson, thanks for watching. See you next time. Never help anybody. <laughs>